this podcast, you'll find interviews with high-performing, successful individuals in life sciences. On a weekly basis, we cover their proven methods, principles, strategies, and mindsets to implement new technologies that scale to meet the needs of people in our world. Welcome to this episode of Life Science Success. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Don and I'm a digital marketer in life sciences. Before we get started today with our interview with Ani Sinha, let's uh, just hear a word from our sponsor. This episode of Life Science Success is brought to you by D3 Digital Media Marketing. Dive into the digital world with confidence and creativity on your side. D3 Digital Media Marketing is your all-in-one solution for making a lasting impact online. From the vibrant, engaging world of social media marketing, podcasts, and webinars, to the strategic depths of website development, SEO, pay-per-click, email, and content marketing, we tailor our approach to fit your unique brand story. Let's elevate your presence, connect with your audience, and drive success together. Your digital journey starts here. Visit d3digitalmedia.com to learn more. This episode... In this episode of Life Science Success, we're with Ani Sinha. She's the Vice President of Commercial Operations at Shinogi with 15 years of experience in the pharmaceutical and biotech industries. And I'm very excited to dive into this conversation with Ani. So thank you so much for being on. Thank you so much for having us. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's great. And um, yeah, I, I it's funny because you're looking at your career. I feel like you've been at so many different places. Um, <laughs> you know, it says Pfizer and Bayer and Celgene and, and now Shinogi. So um, it, all of that experience, you know, has to be just, you know, really translational as well, I would imagine, as you go from company to company. But before we dive into that, I'd love to hear a little bit of what led you to life sciences in the first place. Oh, that's a great question. Um, one that I'd hope is kind of an interesting answer for your uh, listeners and, and viewers. So I started my career thinking I was going to be in the laboratory. So anyone who sees my academic background, I was uh, biochemistry, microbiology, and a PhD program for that. Really had my life charted out for me at the age of you know 23, 24, thinking I'm going to be in a lab, I'm going to get a postdoc, professor, do all that stuff. About halfway through my graduate career, I realized that probably laboratory work was not going to be where I was going to hang my hat. But I recognized that I still loved being in the sciences. And I think a big part of my love came from the fact that I loved getting questions that were complex and then breaking them down into little pieces and then kind of answering those bits and then putting them back together again. And so for me, I knew a career in the sciences was always going to be in my in my cards and my books. But just how that manifested itself is obviously where I am today. I'm pretty far removed from the bench, but very much ingrained in the life sciences. I would imagine that having that, that, that background though has to come in handy, especially, you know, with your commercial role and things like that, just being able to sort of relate to, to the different things that have to happen as well. Right. For sure. I mean, I think where it's definitely held me in good stead is, you know, when we start talking about the mechanism of action of a drug, or when we start trying to figure out how best to describe the value proposition of a therapeutic intervention to different audiences, I think that, you know, since I've been, I've had the good fortune of having a fairly broad and extensive scientific background, it allows me to understand some of those details more easily than let's say someone who has for the most part, you know, been in the business um, administration atmosphere or has been kind of in more of a strategic consulting atmosphere, it allows me to help translate some of those more complex concepts into layman language. And that's definitely a skill that I don't think I would have had ready access to had I not been, again, as you say, firmly ingrained in the life sciences. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would imagine that, um, you know, the overall path, though, to get from the lab to the to your level of commercial expertise, <laughs> you know, isn't one that that I would say is a, probably a very common journey. But at the same time, you know, let's think about some of the listeners of the podcast. All right, so I've okay. had students come up to me and say thank you so much for you know mm -hmm. you know the, the conversations that you have because it helps me sort of mm -hmm. think about where my career could go. But also, mm -hmm. you know, in a more experienced you know realm, um, there may be other people that are also trying to find their way you know, from the bench, mm -hmm. you know, to the commercial realm and, you know, would love to hear sort of what 
influenced your want to, to do that? And then how did, how did it happen? No, I would love to share my thoughts and my story. Hopefully it'll inspire um, some of your you know, eager listeners out there. So for me, my transition from the bench to what I'll say is a more commercial atmosphere was really rooted in the transition between moving from graduate school into a consulting career. So I'll just maybe take a couple steps back. So as I said, from a previous comment about you know, halfway through my graduate degree, I realized I probably wasn't going to be full time at the bench and I wasn't probably going to want to build my career in the laboratory setting. So what I started to do and the school that I went to um, was really we had a fantastic multifunctional kind of graduate career center, and they were really focused on helping graduate students understand what was a good place to go. So I really credit my graduate school with that experience and that you know ability to kind of think outside of the lab. So long story short, we had lots of consulting interviews. We were parts of consulting clubs and we were really helped. We were helped to understand that the skills we were gaining in the laboratory or in the academic setting were actually very transferable into the business setting. It's just a question of, again, as I said, take a big question, break it down. Can you analytically look at you know smaller parts and then build it back together into a piece that's actually important? And so because of that exposure, I moved fairly, I would say, easily from graduate school, from a laboratory setting into management consulting. Now, management consulting, I've often said to many you know, younger people who approach me about career choices and career development, I often tell them, look, if you're really serious about moving into pharma or into biotech, I would strongly recommend a one to three year stint in management consulting, not because I want you to not have a life for three years, which is effectively what happened. Um, But it is fantastic training because you really learn two things. One, you're firmly ingrained and entrenched in the business. I learned more about pharma and biotech in the four and a half years I was in consulting than I think many of my counterparts did in the same period of time in various pharma roles. But number two, you learn a fantastic way of how to tell a story. Like you really, that storytelling skill and the rigor and the Uh, kind of prowess that you gain from that level of rigor and that level of client exposure early on and, you know, having to do all the back office work, but then being put in front of very discerning, very intelligent people who are going to pick apart everything you say. It also builds this level of confidence and comfort in being comfortable with the uncomfortable or comfortable with ambiguity. All those skills in four and a half years wrapped up definitely helped catapult me into the commercial uh, roles that I'm in today, for sure. And I guess what one other question I would have for you related to that to that same topic Mm -hmm. is what other skills did you pick up along the way? I mean, so storytelling, Mm -hmm. obviously, I I mean, that's what kind of brought me here. I mean, this is the, the whole idea of having this platform and having the ability to talk to so many leaders in life sciences was you know, let's try and find a way to help other people get their story out, right? And and sort of mm-hmm. uncover some of those key gems that people learned along the way. And hopefully it helps somebody, you know, as well. And um, so I, I'm a firm believer that story does an awful lot for you, um, you know, mm-hmm. overall. Um, but in addition to that, I guess, what other key things did you take away from, from your experience from management consulting? So I think probably the two biggest lessons I learned was that where that um, number one, you have to be comfortable with ambiguity and you have to be comfortable quickly course correcting. And I think that's that kind of flexibility is not something you readily see from someone who's come from a laboratory setting, not because folks, you know, in the academic setting have failures all the time. And it's not that we can't, you know, bounce back from it. But the idea that you'd be working on something for a set period of time and you're suddenly told, you know what? It's not going to be commercially viable or it's not going to work or, you know, the client has changed their mind. We have to go in a different direction. And you just have to, at a moment's notice, drop everything that you've spent probably tens of days working on and just course correct and move to something else and be okay with that. That's really a skill that I would say very much was acquired in that management consulting experience. I think the second one is also... um, learning how to be a fun person under a lot of pressure, working under very little sleep. So, you know, there's, uh, I'm sure many of your consulting colleagues who are listening to this podcast will appreciate this. Uh, When we used to interview for folks who were coming into the firm, we would do what we would call the, you know, the 12 hour airport test. 
And really all it's saying is, would you want to be stuck with this person in an airport for 12 hours? You know, how do you feel about that? And if the answer is not sure, <laughs> usually that was a no. So yes, learning how to be, you know, lighthearted, to see the good in everything, to find the joy in things, even though you are probably stressed, sleep deprived, malnourished, and probably over medicated. I mean, that's another skill set that we certainly learned in consulting. <laughs> <laughs> as unromantic as that sounds. <laughs> whenever you, whenever you said that, it, it brought me back to I, I, I could di very distinctly remember several, several different global interviews that I've had, and, and yeah. in this um, process, right. So that you typically, it, for a United States based team, you would interview eight hours with them, and then go to the airport, get on an airplane, fly internationally to wherever, and then interview yeah. another eight hours with a, whoever the international team is. And you're not well sure. rested at that point either. So whenever <laughs> you said that, I was like, oh no, did they, did they like envision or or actually put somebody on an airplane and send them across as well? Because I mean, if that was part of my test, I, I don't know that I would have passed if it weren't for coffee. So. There you go. But yes, coffee, sometimes a little bit of Advil and definitely a lot of carbs. Mm -hmm. Yes, for <laughs> sure. For sure. So whenever um, you decided to, to move move or join Shinogi, what actually um, you know led you to make that career decision? And um, let's talk a little bit about your responsibilities as the vice president of commercial operations. No, love to. So um, before, in order to kind of explain how I ended up at Shinogi, I think I probably, just for context, need to give a little bit of background as to the time period between consulting and then Shinogi. I'll try to keep it brief so as not to bore anyone. But basically, what led me to end up in a commercial operations role at a company like Shinogi is really the fact that I've been very, again, lucky in my choice and also very deliberate movement from company to company, from role to role, from discipline to discipline. And so just to be a little bit more specific about that. So I've had roles in analytics. I've had roles in market access. I've had global roles and I've had U.S. roles. I've also had the opportunity to work in therapeutic areas that are vastly different. So dermatology, rheumatology, immunology, oncology, rare disease, but then also, you know, closest thing to primary care and women's health, you know, to allow me to really develop over the past, you know, in between consulting and now. So that's about a decade really provide a very comprehensive and also well-rounded view of the world in terms of what a team really needs, but also what a company needs at a certain point in time. You know, some of the roles that I really will point to as really transformative for me are roles when I've been a chief of staff. So I've had the pleasure of being a chief of staff twice. And I think when you get the opportunity to work very closely with a senior executive, you know, at the, the tippy top of the top of the pyramid, and to understand what their priorities are and how those priorities really match up with the priorities of people maybe much further down the food pyramid. But at the same time, you see the difference in how they're approaching things. And you also see the, the responsibilities and the pulls on their time. So, you know, they have to answer to Wall Street if you're a publicly traded company versus, you know, you fairly, you know, further down in the in the pyramid, you may not have to even think about what earnings looks like or what a Wall Street analyst report would look like and how that would impact the share price. These aren't even things that are on your radar. So bottom line is, I've really been very, very lucky that in the 10 year period to just have had opportunities across all these different areas, which then finally brings me to really just being desirous of a role like commercial operations, where quite frankly, it's, it's a fantastic role. I'm so excited to be here. It's, it's an opportunity to truly learn about the business in a very different way. There are so many different functional areas, which I hope I get a chance to talk about a little bit, um, that all kind of are part of this wonderful quilt that is commercial operations. But also, we truly act as the engineers of the commercial engine. So we really keep the commercial engine going without our help, without us constantly oiling and tweaking and managing the engine. The engine can't go. And so it's really it's, it's an awesome responsibility. Um, but one that I take very seriously, but it's also a fantastic opportunity. Absolutely. And um, so I, I guess if you were to talk a little bit more about your specific role um, there mm -hmm. and, and some of the areas that you touch, um, you might have that opportunity to talk about the different areas of the business that you do get to work with as well. So feel for, free to for sure. yeah, tell me more. Elaborate. 
Yes, no, happy to. So, um, so commercial operations, it's uh, again, across the industry, as you're probably very well familiar with Don, it means often the same thing, but, you know, give or take a few functions. So at Shinogi, we have about six different functions that roll up into commercial operations. So you have your analytics and insights function, you have your market research function, you have sales training and development, which really is learning and development in all fairness, you have meeting planning, you have your field and marketing operations function, which includes things like incentive compensation, territory alignment, field force management. And then you also have field force technology and data management. So that's right away quite a mouthful. Um, it's also a lot of very specialized, highly skilled, but frankly, very disparate disparate functions. And I think what's been particularly fun about the role is helping the company, helping the team, helping myself really identify where there are true synergies and opportunities to work across all these disparate functions. Because even though they're all so specialized and skilled and separate, there's actually a lot of opportunity to cross pollinate, if you will. Sure. And I think that's truly when you see the sum of the parts becomes way more than the individual parts. Yeah, I, I mean, the the one thing that I would, looking at a lot of the different organizations that I've worked with where they have mm -hmm. a commercial operations person, the one thing mm -hmm. I, I always very distinctly tie to the commercial operations role is that mm -hmm. analytics piece and just understanding like, you know, mm -hmm. how do you how do you best understand where to place the, the commercial resources that you have so yeah. that they can have the best, you know, possible chance of, of you know, placing your therapeutic or your, um, your drug, mm -hmm. um, you know, in front of the right people at the right time, uh, as well. And, and I, I mean, I definitely would, would think that your background in analytics, you know, would, would definitely play a key role in that. I can't speak for the other areas. Um, you know, I've, I've, oper I've managed training and things like that, but, um, but certainly, um, not in this, not in this space with these type of people. So, yeah. No, for sure. And I think just kind of pulling on that thread around analytics a little bit, um, you know, that, you know, when I think about when I first started my career, so my very first pharma job was actually in analytics. I was running um, and actually establishing a new function, functional area, analytics focused on our U.S. market access team, which was really 15 years ago, or rather more like a decade ago, it was pretty revolutionary. A lot of pharma companies didn't have that function. Now I fast forward to the function that you know we have now and, and what I have the privilege of working with every day. And really one of the key differences um, is that yes, I have a background in analytics and that helps me uh, to the extent that it helps me, but the role of analytics and insights has just evolved so dramatically over the past 10 to 15 years. You know, When I think about the work that I did as a consultant to support some of my pharma colleagues and pharma clients, I wouldn't say it was linear work, but it was pretty constrained based on what we could do or what we felt we could do. We were really limited to talking to physicians, getting interviews, getting expert opinions, you know, perhaps some very gentle analysis, I'll say, we were allowed to do. But now, fast forward to, you know, today, we are basically creating artificial brains. So we're going to probably talk about artificial intelligence at some point, but I prefer to think of it as we're really training these little artificial brains to basically consume massive quantities of data that, again, we have now evolved quite a bit in terms of our data strategy and data management techniques, uh, again, 15 years later versus when I first started out. And so we're training these brains to basically do a lot of the work for us, but then we're being asked to analyze it and understand what it means. And so we're moving from a realm of you know, rather, I'll say, uh, linear to some extent, historical or prospective or retro, excuse me, retrospective analysis to now we're fast forwarding to very predictive and prescriptive analysis. And I think that transition and that change um, has been really just remarkable to see. But, you know, to your point about com ops and analytics, like that means you're looking for a totally different skill set and a, a totally different set of expectations as a result. Absolutely. And I mean, I mean, we have to speak a little bit about the evolution as well, right? Because I, mm -hmm. I sort of, I, I mean, there've been plenty of my roles in operations where we've, we've run everything out of spreadsheets. We eventually <laughs> have, have run everything out of Tableau, uh, everything out of, you know, click and the other, you know, sort of tools that are around, but yeah. now you sort of look at the, at the vast array of resources that people have both with 
you know, sort of machine learning as well as um, AI tools. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's, it's, it's very enabling and encouraging as well. Um, yeah. But whenever you think about the, the future of the role, how do you sort of see things evolving? Where do you think this goes to next? <laughs> Well, the future of the role for commercial operations. So I think, um, I think first of all, a lot of the functional areas that typically stay within operations, I think will continue to remain within operations. And I think where the evolution comes into play, there are certain pillars that I described that lend themselves to probably a more accelerated view of the world. So analytics and insights, market research, um, learning and development, like these are areas I think that because there's, again, a plethora of data, probably more people focused on more elaborate techniques around those areas, there's just a much more natural progression and probably a more aggressive progression of those areas. But I think one of the areas I always want to mention is when you think about how best to deploy your field force, that's an area that's going to definitely continue to evolve within the functional areas. Because as we start to overlay more data, and when I just talk about data, it's not just the data, it's what the data is telling us. How do we best deploy our field force? They're still one of the mainstays of, of a pharma engagement model. You can't really get away from that um, unless you have you know, the ultra rare disease where you know every patient in the United States, which already probably comes up with some issues there. But bottom line is your field force is your main kind of mainstay there in terms of your engagement model. How do we deploy them more effectively? How do we deploy them more efficiently? That's always going to continue to evolve. So short answer, where are we going to evolve to? Yes, we've got your analytics and your market research and your learning and development. But I would say the area that I would be most interested in watching is what happens in field ops and how we continue to deploy our field force effectively. Very interesting. So in general, in your career, what are you most proud of, proud of or excited about? So it's probably twofold. I think one of the things I'm most proud of is I think about some of the teams that I've built. And really for me, I, so if some of your listeners are familiar with the disc profile, they're probably familiar with red, yellow, green, blue. So I'm, you know, very yellow and red. And for me, I, I take building a team very seriously and I take that level of kind of camaraderie and that level of trust and just loyalty within a team very seriously. So when I think back about some of the smaller companies I've been at where I have been able to build a team from basically the land of misfit toys, you kind of pull together a bunch of people, um, but then you, know, you have this wonderful community and you have this team that has been brought together in a way that they maybe didn't previously imagine and it works even better than you thought it would when you first conceptualized it. That's probably... There's probably two or three examples that I can mention that I'm particularly proud of, and that's really a crowning moment of my career thus far. I think just in general, I would say I'm proud of the fact, just as an individual contributor, I'm proud of the fact that I've been able to navigate different companies and also navigate different functional areas relatively successfully. Because I think what's been helpful is now somebody looks at my resume and they look at me and say, well, we don't really know what you do. And I actually wear that as a badge of honor because I don't want to be pigeonholed in one specific area. I like to be a bit of a generalist. And I think the way I've described myself at conferences is I'm a bit of a generalist specialist because I can become specialized in some of these areas because of my background, but I'm choosing to stay on the surface a little bit and be that generalist view because I think there's value in people being generalists. They have a different perspective and a different point of view versus the folks who are truly the subject matter experts and bring that deep, deep expertise. Yeah, I kind of chuckled at the generalist comment because I've I've been tagged with the same exact thing. So yeah, I I, I resemble generalist that. unite I resemble that name. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how do you see the role of of analytics and insights? Um, you know, as it as it evolves, how do you see it? You, you know, evolving. I guess beyond just the the geographical nature of of where do you place resources? Where where do you think it goes? to next? For sure. So if I go back to when I think about where analytics and insights was, again, 10, 15 years ago, fairly linear, fairly constrained, you know, we didn't have great data sources, we were just starting to learn how to do some of those more advanced predictive analyses. I would say where I'm seeing it go and go, because that's where I'm seeing it kind of evolve too, is to become much more predictive and prescriptive. So I think one of the key elements of an analytics and insights team now 
is you need to be able to look at multiple data sources together at once. You need to be able to diagnose and understand what it's telling you. And you also need to be able to make recommendations about what that data or what that final finding is telling you to go towards. So I've often described analytics and insights teams as we need to be the GPS of the organization. So what I used to say is, well, we need to be the GPS of the organization. We should be able to tell the company which direction to go and the shortest way to get there. But we might, we might not be able to tell them how to get there. Now, my epithet there is changing to no, it's the two things that I said. Plus, we now need to be able to tell them how to get there. And that's where I see analytics evolving to. Uh, amazing. So what challenges and opportunities have you encountered while leading diverse functions like market research and field operations? <laughs> so I think one, so market research, field operations in particular, but I'll just maybe broaden that a little bit to operations in general. I think candidly, one of the biggest challenges I have, and I think most operations professionals would agree with me, you know, operations by definition can be a little bit nuts and boltsy. You know, we're talking about things that need to happen. They're not the most exciting or the most, you know, always innovative areas. And, you know, they lack that luster that our sales and marketing colleagues have or our market access colleagues. You know, they it's just much more nuts and bolts. But I think one of the biggest challenges I have is really finding ways to continuously infuse innovation and new thinking and communicate that accordingly but at the same time, help the organization recognize like the nuts and bolts are still critical. Again, as I said in the beginning, like we are the engineers that keep the commercial engine going. So sometimes you need to use that, you know, that that unattractive wrench to keep things going. It doesn't mean that what you're doing is less valuable. It just means it's more foundational. And I think that's probably the biggest challenge that I hope other operations professionals can relate to. And hopefully I would be very happy to get advice on how best to (laughs) approach that in the future. Yeah, I feel like, I mean, I, I I guess the way I would sum up what you're, the comment that you, that you made is that I feel like operations leaders, at least the best ones that I've known can Mm -hmm. both think strategically and Mm -hmm. operate very tactically when needed. Right. So um, yes, you're a leader. You need to, you know, spend a good portion of your time kind of thinking where mm-hmm. where are you going uh, overall as an organization. But I feel like the best operations leaders also are so in touch with the details. They just know kind of you know one of the one of the operations leaders that I had hired long long ago. Um, he mm-hmm. had said, you know, look, if you woke me up at, at 1 a.m., I would still be able to tell you all the details for where everything is right at this point in time, right? I wouldn't have to think about it. It's just impressive. In, yeah. in my mind and, and there. So, yes, I mean, I I agree with you. I think I think that, um, you know, the, the, that ability to kind of phase shift um, back and forth mm-hmm. is something that not a lot of people have. Um, but some of the best operations leaders that I know of, at least, you know, they're able to, to kind of do that very well and, and sort of help the organization move from, you know, what they plan to do to what they're doing. Right. And you know what, Don, if I can just build on that, because that's a great point. I think one challenge, but that also becomes an opportunity for us as operations leaders is being able to translate some of those drier details into the the WIFMs, you know, the what's in it for me, for the organization. So, you know, to your point, like anyone who's going through budget process will appreciate, you know, a lot of operations line items end up on a budget and people kind of look at that and they, you know, crinkle their nose and they go, I don't get it. Like, what is that? Why is that important? And it's really the onus is on the operations leader to be able to explain why that, you know, supposedly obscure detail or line item that costs, you know, $400,000, why it's critical for the organization, what it's actually going to bring value around, and more importantly, how it's going to keep that engine going. So I completely agree with you and all the leaders that you've probably hired. There's, there is a lot of that uh, phase shifting, as you called it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So how is Shinogi addressing the latest trends and challenges in the biotech and pharmaceutical sectors? (laughs) So first of all, very proud to be part of this company. I think the way I'll discuss that is 
I first want to kind of maybe mention what I think some of the key challenges in the pharma industry are. And I think the biggest challenge, so we can talk about, you know, all of the like really annoying challenges, you know, oh, patient out of pocket is too high. The cost of drugs is too high. Drug development takes too long. But I think when I was thinking about this and really boiling it down to me, one of the biggest challenges the pharma industry has is how do we keep up? And what I mean by that is society and the medical kind of innovations that are ongoing every day, they're identifying new conditions, new diseases, new ailments much faster than the pharma industry can keep up in terms of developing those interventions. And so I would say that not just for my company, but for, you know, the pharma industry in general, one of the biggest challenges we're facing is how do we continue to find, identify, develop put resources and and means against developing those key therapeutic interventions that are going to be safe, effective, and appropriate for those areas of high unmet need. And I think that's really an area where I'm particularly proud to be part of the pharma industry because I know that every day when I wake up and I sit down on my laptop, somehow the work that I'm doing translates into helping patients. To me, that's the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely it is. And, um, you know, I, I, I certainly echo many of the things that you started with as well, right? That, that mm-hmm. this, isn't, this isn't an easy path or an easy industry to be a part of. And it receives a lot, mm-hmm. of, a lot of criticism in general whenever there's a lot of contributing factors to a lot of the things that you talk about. Drug prices being high, yeah. you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of reasons why drug prices are high. Um, right. and there's a lot of reasons why they're not so high in other countries as well. So, I mean, yeah. I do feel like there's, um, there is a level of that. And I, I just mentioned this in the interview with John LaMantina as well, that, yep. you know, the, mm-hmm. you know, similar sort of challenges that people, you know, oftentimes just don't take the time to, to really understand. But at the same time, whenever it comes to things like COVID or, you know, you have a family member that unfortunately has cancer or some rare disease yeah. that you'd love to have cured. Wouldn't it be nice to have a drug company that has the ability and the research means to go out and not only research it, but place the drug where it needs to be whenever your care provider needs it. So, um, exactly. yeah, I completely agree with you. Yeah. So, What's the greatest leadership advice that you've ever received? Oh, so this one's thankfully an easy one. Um, and it's because it's been repeated to me several times. And, you know, some of the bosses and the leaders that I've had the privilege of knowing, I think they've exemplified this themselves. So it's very easy advice for them to give. And it's it's advice that I would I give myself every day. And I also happily impart it. I think it's really two things. The first is be authentic, you know, Being your authentic self and showing up as your authentic self, I can think of three or four different areas where, or experiences where I suppressed my authentic self. And that really did me a lot of, that did me a disservice. It did the company a disservice. It did me a disservice. And I think that's where, you know, it's okay to be a little goofy and silly if that's who you are, you know, let your, let your goofy flag fly. That's okay. You know, but be your authentic self. I think people respond to it and then they, they naturally trust and believe and and follow what you say because they know that you are coming from a good place and it's coming from a place of honesty and authenticity. I think the the second really key leadership lesson or, or value that I've been provided is, you know, again, communicate your values and communicate them often. So I think a lot of folks often say, well, you know, you need to have values and, you know, that's an important part, but it's like, yes, but if you keep them to yourself, nobody knows what they are. And sometimes it's hard to always discern what people's values are if they don't say anything. So for me, it's really communicating them, communicate them often, make sure they're part of your vernacular, make sure they're part of the messages that you provide your team and your greater uh, company. And I think those are really some of the best lessons I've learned over time. Such a, such an important point, point, important point, not just for people that let's say, I mean, with you, with a large organization that you lead, um, mm-hmm. I would imagine you're having to communicate things multiple times, but as an indivi- as an individual, whenever you think about people understanding mm-hmm. your values, um, you may not think about how many people actually in your circle, in your immediate sphere, that need to really understand, you know, where exactly you're coming from and kind of what your values are, um, just so that they they know who you are as an individual. So that's, exactly. a, I, I feel like that's a really critical takeaway for anybody that's, uh, that's listening or watching as well. Oh, I hope so. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, what inspires you? 
So pulling on that authenticity thread, I will say what inspires me is seeing someone or people or a team or a company, this could be you know, any entity that's genuinely excited by what they do, that they're passionate and they're excited and they, they aren't afraid to show it. I think there's, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm of the generation where I think we're we potentially might be a little entitled and feel like things should just come our way. Um, that's what I understand, at least when I Google our generation. But that being said, um, I think there's sometimes a disconnect where there are folks in companies and in, in, in roles that are a little bit more sedate and feel like, okay, you know, be a little bit more professional, hold it in. Don't, don't demonstrate enthusiasm on a constant basis. And for me, I just... I don't think there's anything wrong with being enthusiastic and being excited about what you do. I don't think there's anything wrong with sharing that as long as it's again in an appropriate way. And so for me, that's really what gets me going in the morning when I see people who are just genuinely excited about what they do, because I'm somebody who's genuinely excited by what I do and I have no problem sharing that. (laughs) Well, thank you for sharing that. And Ani, what concerns you? Oh, well, I think what concerns me, and this may echo your previous guest from last week's podcast, what concerns me is the fact that people do make the pharma industry the boogeyman. That's something that I I do feel deeply about. I've probably, what I'm about to say, probably, unfortunately, many of your listeners will will, uh, relate to where, you know, I've been around a Thanksgiving dinner table and people start to trash the pharma industry. And then they point at you and say, well, you're part of the problem. And, you know, your industry, how do they, how do they sleep at night feeling like they can steal money from people's bank accounts to pay for their diabetes treatment or whatever it is, whatever misguided piece of information they have. And, you know, that's maybe a poor example, but I do, I do feel, I do worry about that. And I do feel that when in time of need, pharma becomes the enemy, when in time of need, pharma can also be the savior. I think COVID was a great example where suddenly, you know, when you look at some of those Gallup polls where pharma, you know, the reputational kind of aspect of it went up considerably during COVID, because again, everyone was desperate for a treatment, desperate for a vaccine and pharma came through. Um, And as soon as, you know, that's been kind of in the rear view mirror, suddenly right back there where politicians, societalists, other folks will just talk about, oh, pharma is the big bad, you know, boogeyman. And I think that really, as someone who's been a proud member of the community for, you know, at least a decade, it does bother me and it concerns me. And I wish there was a way to help people understand that the work we do is really meaningful and the work we do is truly transformative. Yeah, and I mean, I'm I'm slightly concerned as well on the opposite side. I guess you talked about a couple of these things, but um, there's this there's all of the people and all of the um, intellectual property that's out there to to cure the next thing um, that mm-hmm. is being th- thought about in the different elements where people have people are entrepreneurs that are essentially building mm-hmm. you know new technologies or new drugs. And um, Mm -hmm. I worry as well, you know, similarly that a part of what we're seeing in terms of the starvation of that industry, that part of the industry Mm -hmm. anyway, because we're not seeing a lot of venture capital investment still, you know, after all the economic, you know, challenges that we've had. Mm -hmm. Um, And I have a feeling that some of the larger pharma companies as they turn around to go, okay, so I want to go buy the next um, you know, NK drug, or I want to go buy the next, yeah. you know, CAR T cell therapy or whatever. Um, they're going to turn around and see a little bit more of a vacuum than they've seen in the past because of the fact that a lot of these companies just starved in the valley of death somewhere and didn't make it through, um, weren't able to continue their research. And so, I, you know, I mm-hmm. kind of, you know, I feel like there's there's add on factors to the the idea of you know, hey, let's let's kind of villainize you know, where we are currently. Mm-hmm. Um, I mm-hmm. think big, it's going to take big ideas and big solutions to try and make things better. And yeah. by sort of pointing your finger at one particular part and saying, right. this is the problem, isn't really the answer. So, yeah, no, I agree. And I guess just to add to that, Don, that, you know, having been part of two small pharma companies myself, and again, very proud, you know, alumni of them, I, I can attest to the fact that you know funding is drying up. Funding is capital is getting more and more expensive. Um, funding is getting more and more expensive. And you know, to your point, 
often those smaller biotech companies are kind of the the feeder pool, if you will, for that innovation. You know, somebody has a great idea. Some, often the big ideas are coming from those smaller companies. Somebody has a big idea and they put their blood, sweat and tears into it. And if that feeder pool dries up, there's not going to be anything to commercialize. There's not going to be any innovation to grab to. But I think the bigger question that we all should be asking is why is it that that feeder pool is drying up? Like what's causing it? Is it truly just the fact that capital is getting more expensive to fund? And I see that there's some recovery, you know, in the past, let's say six to 10 months, we're seeing some bounce back of that. But is it truly just that? Or is it something else that's a little bit more inherent? Are we potentially recruiting the wrong talent in those areas? Are we potentially asking too much of the talent that we're recruiting in those areas? I mean, these are some of the probably bigger questions that now that you brought it up also keep me up at night. <laughs> but yeah, but not to be insensitive to it, but these are these are big questions with probably bigger answers. For sure. Well, Ani, thank you for sharing that. And last question, what excites you? Oh, what excites me. I think it's the same thing that inspires me. It's again, people that are passionate and excited about what they do, that excites me. But right now what excites me is honestly getting up every day and uh, knowing I have a new adventure every day. It's, there's something very exciting about being a relatively new member of a team and a relatively new member of a company. Every day is a new day. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you so much for being on the Life Science Success Podcast. I greatly appreciated you being here. And um, this is not a conversation that we have got to have very much of you know, in the past. So it's great to get to explore a little bit more of commercial operations and everything that you touch. Well, thank you so much for having me, Don. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Ani. Thank you for listening to Life Science Success. For complete details about this podcast, including show notes, how to get in touch with guests, and more episodes, please visit www.lifesciencesuccess.com. If there's someone you'd like for us to invite to the show as a guest, please let me know by sending me a message at the podcast website. Please click subscribe on your favorite podcast app, share the podcast, or tell a friend about it, and last but not least, rate the podcast. Thank you again. Thank you again.